creating your own language. So let's start with the um, Swadesh list. That's not the one. There we go. Okay, so this is the first resource that I often give my students uh, in, in starting to think about their language. This is called as a Swadesh's 100 word list. It, it was created by a linguist called Morris uh, Swadesh, so it was named after him. Um, and what he did was he created a list of 100 words that he thought were represented universal concepts across languages. So very often this is a great first place to start thinking about creating new words in your language. I'm not saying that you need to create all these hundred words, but very often it will give you an idea, um, you know, of basic concepts that you might need within your world building process or um, your character, you know, um, um, visualization, etc. So this is the Swedish 100 word list. And then I also have another 200 word list by another linguist called Gudshinsky's. Um, and th there might be some overlap between the Swedish uh, list and Gudshinsky's list. But, you know, uh, I, I always like to give these two. Um, very early on in the semester, just so that you can kind of, you know, um, start to think about what you might want from this list and start to think about language, words, etc. As you can see, these are words in English, so they are really simple words. They're not complicated words, as you can see, right? Uh, they're all simple morphemes, simple words, but remember that for your, la your language, I do need to see a little bit more than just simple words. Right. I don't I don't want you to give me 200 words that look exactly like this, like really simple in morphology and, you know, that kind of thing. This is already up on Blackboard. Uh, so if you go into um, I, I believe the folder is called as handout. So if you go into that folder, you will be able uh, to access um, this list. I've already opened this up. Um, OK, so let's uh, stop the share and let me share. Another resource that we will be talking about um, next week a lot more. Uh, this is the International Phonetic Alphabet. Many of you might have seen this before in uh, another linguistic class. If you have taken um, Linguistics 306, Acoustic Phonetics, or Linguistics 506, um, Advanced Acoustic Phonetics. Uh, if you have taken 315 with me, you wouldn't have seen this because I give you the um, alphabet for English, which I will also share in a minute. But this is the entire international phonetic alphabet. This is what it looks like. Um, if you've never seen this before, do not freak out. This is just the universal way of representing any sound in any language. Um, it's really intuitive once I, uh, you know, walk you through it, once I walk you through the articulatory phonetics uh, process, which I will be doing next week. Uh, it will be a refresher for people who have done 315 with me or people who have done acoustic phonetics before, but I think it's always good to refresh yourself with IPA. Um, so the way that the IPA chart is organized as you have the consonants right up here on top. Uh, some of the consonants look really familiar to you. They're very similar to the Roman alphabets. This is the B and the B, the T, D, etc. But then you also have sounds that are not in English. So for example, this sound and this sound, the retroflex plosive sounds, English does not have it. Uh, it's pronounced ta, ta, ra, ra. Right. So a lot of um, languages that I speak, South Asian languages, we have a lot of retroflexes, uh, but English does not have retroflexes. The only retroflex that you do have is your um, retroflex approximant, which is your R, R, right, to so the way that you um, you you roll your tongue when you say your R uh, in American English versus in uh, British English, you don't do that. So you say car in American English, but you say car in British English because you don't roll that tongue. So, uh, so that's the only retroflex you have. And then there's a lot of other sounds that English does not have like the fricatives. A um, Couple of these fricatives, for example, they are found in German, very closely related to English, but not in English, English lost it. 
if you do history of English with me, uh, which some of you might be doing this semester, we will talk about this. Um, old English had some of these sounds, but then when we came into modern um, English, we actually started losing um, these sounds. So that's the pulmonic consonants. Um, and then you have a lot of non-pulmonic consonants. English does not have these sounds, but if you have um, studied any African Bantu languages, you would have seen some of these clicks, uh, for example. Um, if you have, um, let me see what language uh, would have a voiced implosive. There's a language in India called Sindhi. Um, it's, it's very similar to Punjabi. It's spoken in Northern India. Uh, Sindhi is an example of a language which has a lot of these kind of voiced uh, implosives uh, right here. And then there are also sounds that are uh, ejectives in languages. But again, English does not have any of the, these uh, sounds. And then you also have the vowel chart right here. Um, so these are the consonants. Uh, and these are the vowel charts. And we will go over all this in detail next week. But I just want to kind of give you this because this is how you will be writing your words in your language using the IPA chart. So I just, I've already opened this up. It's on Blackboard. You can access it really easily from there. And I also have the same chart that I hand out in um, English uh, 315. So I want to kind of just show you that chart really quickly. Um, and that's just an easier way of understanding the international uh, phonetic alphabet. Uh, so this is the chart that uh, a lot of you who have done 315 with me might have already seen. This is the international phonetic alphabet, but just for English. Um, and this is a chart that I have created. So it looks, it, for me, it is a more accessible version than the other uh, chart. Um, but again, like I said, these are only sounds belonging to English, uh, but for the purposes of Linguistics 151, you also need the other sounds because you know you might be creating um, a word uh, which, which does not have a sound that English has. So you obviously need to keep the other um, chart as well. So this chart is organized according to consonants. And if you go down the next page, these are all vowels. And I have divided it up according to the sounds that English has. So you have stops, you have fricatives, affricates, and semi vowels. And then you have the uh, vowels. There are two kinds of vowels pure vowels and diphthongs. And you will see you have tense vowels, lax vowels and uh, the major and minor diphthongs. The good thing about this chart that I have created is that I have examples on the side highlighting the particular sound that is represented by this uh, sound in the brackets. So this is going to be a really uh, good example for you to keep with you when you are creating your uh, words in your uh, language as well. So I would advise you to keep both the international phonetic uh, chart for all sounds as well as the International Phonetic Alphabet for English uh, while you are creating your sounds. And I will go through this in detail next week. That's, that's what we are going to be doing um, next week. So do not worry if all this is new to you. I just wanted to kind of share with you to show you that I have this resource available um, on Blackboard. All right, so the last thing that I then wanted to show you was another resource for creating your language. And, okay. So this is the Khan Langer's Library. This is a great website. I can put the website in the chat so that you can bookmark it and keep it for reference later on. Um, this, this website has a lot of resources, right? I mean, it, it's a really great website for you to start creating your language. So you have the Swedacious list, but then you also have a 850 word list of Ogden's Oxlang, um, which is a very good resource again uh, for vocabulary creation of conlangs. Um, there are also a lot of essays on how do you design an artificial language? How do you design a constructed language? The Language Creation Society uh, is a great resource. Um, I have in the past had students uh, from Linguistics 151 who have sent in abstracts 
um, for to the Language Creation Society's conference. So that is a really great resource for you if you're interested in, you know, um, submitting something to the Language Creation Society's conference. Uh, it, it's, it's a great presentation, um, you know, place, and you will get a lot of feedback for your own language. Uh, and then you have other uh, resources such as the Language Construction Kit, which is right here, right? Oh, <laughs> Landon has the book. Do you have your own constructed language, Landon? Oh, several. Several, okay, okay. So are you planning yeah, to make a new one? Or? Mark, all of Mark Rosenfelder's books. So okay. I have the language construction kit, I have advanced language construction, syntax construction kit, Colin Langer's Lexipedia. I'm ready to go. Yes. This is why you're an applied linguistics major. I love it. Uh, so um, are you planning on making a new language for the class or uh, recycling one of your several um, languages that exist? Um, I think it's I'll. Honest. It's okay. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'll, I'll think about the prompt more and um, probably I'll definitely take influence from my already existing languages. Sure. And that's that's perfectly okay to do so. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So then there are also other online tools that, you know, if you, you know, like how you put in letters of English and it spurts out words in English that you want, like, especially if you've been playing Wordle. I don't know if you you guys have been playing Wordle or not. Do you do you, do you all know what Wordle is? Have you heard of Wordle? Okay. Some of you have said it says, yeah. So it's a it's a game that's on your phone and every day there's a new word that you need to solve and you only get six attempts to solve it. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's gone viral. A lot of people play it. My husband and I play it and we always exchange notes like, oh, I got it in like two attempts. And my husband is like, yeah, I got it in four attempts. And yeah, so um, it, it's okay. It's, it's nothing great. But, you know, if you like languages, you will probably like Wordle. Um, but these are word generators of nonce um, sounds, right? So not English sounds, but like any uh, sound combinations that you want. Uh, and then there's also the World Atlas of Language Structures, which, you know, is similar to the World Atlas of Natural Language, but this is for constructed languages. So that, that is really a great resource. And David Peterson, I mean, if you know anything about constructed languages, you probably know David Peterson. He is the father of constructed languages. That, that's, that's what I think he would like to be called. Uh, David is, a, the, the way that I would describe David is he's a serial conlanger, right? He creates constructed languages on a daily basis. He is the person who um, anybody in Hollywood would like to call on to create a language. He created Dothraki, uh, from Game of Thrones, if that's, you know, one of the series that you would watch. So he is a really famous um, conlanger. I actually wanted to invite David to give a talk. Um, you know, I think it, this was just before COVID and then COVID happened. And then, you know, um, yeah, that didn't happen. But uh, maybe we could ask him to give a talk on Zoom now because Zoom talks are a thing now. So, you know, I will see what I can do. He's really famous. He might not have the time. But if he does have the time, I would like to invite him to give a talk to all of you because I really, you know, think that he would be a great resource uh, to hear from. Um, I also have another uh, colleague of mine who uh, finished his PhD from University of Kansas, who's also created his own language. Uh, very often has, uh, you know, I have him either come down to Wichita to give like a workshop or uh, again, like, you know, now that we are on Zoom, we can easily ask him to come on Zoom and talk about his language. Uh, so if David is not available, he is a great resource for you as well. So I just wanted to point this out that there, there are all these resources you're not alone in creating languages. Uh, so please use these resources um, early on. Start using them, you know. Okay. Now, what I want to do today is I want to finish up um, lecture three, which is what we were on on Tuesday. And then the rest of the time, I'm going to divide you up into groups and you will be doing a group activity today. So that's, uh, that's what we are going to do for the rest of the time. So let's finish up um, the last remaining slides of lecture uh, three, which I was on, uh, which I started talking about on Tuesday. 
So we started talking about the three uh, substructures of language. Do you all remember what the three substructures of language are from last class? Phonology, morphology, and syntax? Correct. Yes, thank you. Phonology, morphology, and syntax. And remember that languages also have other substructures. We don't really talk about them here in Linguistics 151, but if you do 315 with me or any other advanced linguistic class, we will talk about semantics and pragmatics and um, you know, uh, language variation and typology and all that. So, but in Linguistics 151, we are only really concerned with the phonology, the morphology, and the syntax of languages. These are the three things that you would need to know in order to create your own language. So the three-part substructure of language actually creates some design features of language. And it, it, it is these design features of language that actually distinguish language from any other communication system, such as animal communication system uh, or constructed languages, et cetera. So what are these design features of language? So I will walk you through what these are and then your group activity is really going to give you an example on what these design features look like because uh, the, the thing with linguistics is when you do practice, when you actually problem solve, things click a lot more than just listening to my boring uh, lecture. So that's what we're going to do. I'll, I'll walk you through these and then you do the group activity so that it kind of drives home the point. So the first one, and I think this is something that I have talked about quite a bit um, on Tuesday, as well as last week, language is arbitrary. We looked at this with respect to the symbolic nature of sign systems and symbolic nature of uh, language. So there are different morphemes in language and the meaning associated with these morphemes are completely arbitrary, right? We saw this example with a dog uh, in English and perro in uh, Spanish. They have the same meaning, but the morphemes themselves are only arbitrarily related uh, to their meaning. There's nothing about d, a, uh, and g that says that if you combine it together, you get that fluffy best friend of man, right? That's completely arbitrary. The second design feature of language is called as displacement. Why is displacement a crucial design feature of human language? The fact that we can talk about things that will happen in the future or things that happen in the past, that space and time continuum that human language can actually express. That is what we call as displacement. Animals cannot do that. Animals cannot communicate about what happened in the past and what will happen in the future because they have really no language that can actually you know, express that kind of space and time continuum. They always live in the present. Maybe a good thing to do, take out a lot of stress and anxiety from our lives. But if they bark, they, it's about something that they want right now right? I'm hungry right now. I need to go pee right now, right? Take me out. But they're not talking about, okay, I'm going to bark right now. You take me out human five minutes later. That's not going to happen, right? I mean, they, they don't have that ability to displace and talk about meaning. So for example, the classic example that we often talk about in linguistics with displacement is the present king of France, um, as you probably know, France is not a monarchy, but it used to be, um, you know, uh, in the past. But you can still talk about the present king of France, even though there is actually no present king of France, right? So that's the idea about displacement, that in a parallel possible world that France is a monarchy, um, there could be a present king of France, right, to throw in a little bit of semantics in there. But you perfectly understand the meaning, even though there is actually no real king of France as we speak right now. Creativity, I mean, the whole idea of Linguistics 151 is to show the creativity of language, show how you can use language creatively. There are only, you know, um, th th there are infinite means but from a finite form. So there are only certain sounds that can be used in language. We saw the IPA chart, right? That's universally all the sounds that exist in the world. So that's a finite form, but from that finite form of language, you can create infinite number of utterances, 
right? The number of utterances that you need to create is literally unbound. I mean, you can think of, you know, I told you my three and a half year old daughter, her favorite pastime right now is rhyming. So, you know, if you give her a word, she will create a rhyme, but very often that's not a real world of English. So, you know, <laughs> she creates that word and then I tell her, yeah, that's not really how it works, sweetheart. You know, you need to make a word that, that, that actually exists. And then her question to me is always, but well, why doesn't this word exist? Like for her, it's like, you know, it's a rhyme, it should exist, you know? And I'm like, okay, at some point in time, please come to my class. <laughs> you know, I can explain to you why this is not gonna happen, but maybe not when you're three and a half, but you know. Um, so, you know, you can always ask the question, right? Why can't you make that word of English? Why doesn't that word exist, right? I mean, there are all sorts of irregular past tense and plural uh, in English. So you can say mouse, mice, why can't you say mouses, right? I mean, to do that, you need to learn history of English. So, you know, come to that class and we will talk a lot more about that in history of English. But, um, but, but, but to a child learning a new language, right? Or, or for a child learning um, her first language, it's completely nonsensical, right? To not have that word because that's something that she can easily produce and her grammar or her limited grammar is saying, a completely okay word to do. So that's what you need to do for your constructed language, right? Just forget about the rules that constrain English and just go wild, right? And create whatever language you want. There are two properties to being creative um, and creativity in language. One is called openness and the other is recursion. What do you mean by openness? Well, language or many parts of language, like many lexical categories of language, are open to new morphemes to express new ideas. So you can create tune, a short form for cartoon, or schmooze, entertaining and getting entertained by lobbyists, or you know, um, a, a new word that came up and is now quite the rage in English is Google, right? When Google uh, was created, it was just a term for a new company that was started, but now we use it all the time we use I'm Googling, right? To mean that I'm using Google to find something. So you're using Google as a verb, right? But you can also use Google as a noun, etc. So this is something that happened in the last, you know, 10, 15 years or so. So English is quite open in that it allows new ideas and new morphemes uh, to come uh, from. But again, not all lexical categories are open. So there are closed lexical categories in language such as the pronouns. The pronouns are a very closed category. Uh, but again, you know, there is innovation, uh, but limited innovation in certain lexical uh, categories. Nouns and verbs are a lot more open than certain other uh, lexical categories um, of language. Recursion is the other um, aspect of creativity. So uh, for example, in English and in a lot of other languages, you can expand phrases and you know, add on and on and on. So you can say a friend, a friend of mine, a friend of a friend of mine, a friend of a friend of a friend of mine, et cetera, right? And so this is called as recursion. You can keep adding on things to phrases and create longer, uh, sentence structures. So openness and recursion are two aspects of the creativity of human language, right? And again, something that animal communication uh, cannot do or, um, you know, chimpanzee or primate communication uh, cannot uh, do and distinguishes itself from uh, human language. Um, recursion also makes it difficult to set a limit on the length of sentences. So you can have really long sentences in English precisely because of um, recursion. Uh, what is the longest sentence in English? We cannot predict because you can just keep on adding to any sentence of English and create really lengthy, long uh, pieces. So that's something that you can also do in your constructed languages, uh, depending on what kind of morphology and what kind of syntactical structures you're using, you can add recursion as a, you know, a feature, a design feature of your constructed language and keep adding different uh, combinations and permutations and create bigger uh, sentence structures. The next design feature of language is called as duality. And the duality of the sign is, is there are two parts to any sign, right? We talked about this. There's a form and the meaning. 
And the, the form or the phones them, themselves, the sound systems of language are meaningless. The only thing that are meaningful in language are the morphemes, right? So the morphemes are what gives the meaning and the form themselves are meaningless. So if I have d, a, and g, without that morpheme that is a meaningful part of language, just the sound system is completely meaningless, right? So it's the form and the meaning, the duality uh, or the two part structure of any uh, sign. Uh, the, the way that human language is set up, uh, it, it, grammaticality plays a huge role in um, understanding and meaning and communication of human language. So there are only certain possible combinations that give meaning. So path is a possible word in English, but not per, t, and a, right? So you just interchange the sound system and then you completely lose the meaning. Uh, you have a meaningless form, but there is no uh, counterpart semantics to it, no counterpart morpheme to it that is meaningful. Uh, are they here is okay, but not came they here, uh, right? And, and so again, why are these not okay in English? It's because of the constraints imposed by the syntax of the grammar, right? Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, you know, syntactic theoretical models that we can talk about here, but I'm not going to get into that because that's, you know, if you're interested, that's advanced um, linguistics and advanced syntax. Uh, but as a native speaker of English, you know that these are not possible, right? And that's the grammaticality aspect um, of language. So here is another example. Uh, if a noun is in plural, that is expressed as a suffix on the noun. So I a to pair is not okay. And the star notation uh, in front of I, it means gr ungrammatical in linguistics. So whenever you see that star notation, it means that that is not a possible sentence of the language. So even though the plurality uh, of pair is expressed by two, the numeral, you still need to have the plural markers on pair, right? So I ate two pairs is grammatical, but not I ate two pair. You know, you can ask the question, why is it this case? Because a lot of other languages like Chinese and um, uh, a lot of other South Asian languages do allow this to be grammatical. So I a two pair is completely grammatical in Chinese, in Mandarin Chinese, but not okay in English. So there is some extra grammatical rule in English that says that even though you show the plurality with the numeral two, you still need to have that plural marker, otherwise that's completely ungrammatical. You might be able to create a language, which is not like English, which just has the numeral to express plurality and don't have the plural marker, right? Because really the way I see it is it's redundant. Language is redundant. English is a very redundant language, if you ask me, right? You say, I ate two, pairs where the plural is marked on two as well as the plural marker on s. Okay. Now, again, I, I have answers to this and I can give you answers, but I think it's just advanced for linguistics 151. So we are not going to get into why this is not okay in English, but you know, there are reasons that are grammatical reasons for why it's not okay in English. And the last uh, design feature is cultural transmission. So, um, the learning of languages of different dialects and varieties of language differ from place to place. So depending on geographical location, uh, depending on age and depending on, um, you know, other sociocultural factors, uh, the cultural transmission and that learning uh, kind of differs uh, across time and space. So that's the last uh, design feature uh, of language. So this is, you know, I would have started a new lecture today, but I really want you to get into the group activity so that you can kind of um, work together on understanding the design features better. But just a reminder that your assignment is due on Tuesday. I open it up as um, a Blackboard submission. It should already be live and open if you haven't seen it. Um, just submit it online before you come to class on Tuesday. But obviously, like I said, I do allow submissions up to three times late. So if you cannot finish the assignment on time, do not freak out. Just let me know that you will be submitting it later um, and you will be taking a late on it. All right. Any questions on the material that we just covered today? Okay. So 
Um, what I want you to do, let me walk you through the group activity, but uh, it should already be up on Blackboard. So if you guys want to go on Blackboard and access this uh, individually, that's fine as well. Let me show it to you, to you here and tell you what you guys need to do, and then I will create break breakout rooms for each of you. So this is what the group activity looks like. So you have one question on the design feature of arbitrariness, and this is uh, examples from Amharic. I have given you the English translation of these Amharic uh, sentences. If you have never seen linguistic data like this before, this is a good, um, you know, uh, first time to see these kind of sentences. So the way that you would read it is, this is of Mariam, right? So je majam of Mariam, ihit och sisters, na nach nach right? So be present tense. So you you're seeing that I've given you the Amharic in Roman alphabet because Amharic does have its own alphabet which none of us can read. Um, and then you have the gloss, and then you also have the English uh, transliteration. So they are Mary's sisters, is the English translate, translation of this Amharic sentence. Now, these are statement of the rules of grammar, which describe such short English sentences is not simple. So you have a pronoun, they or she is first in the sentence, followed by the present tense verb. So these are all the grammatical rules that create these two English sentences. I want you to look at the Amharic sentences and create a short grammar uh, template for Amharic. I have done this for you in English. So look at the English sentences, look at this how, to see how I've described English. Look at the Amharic, understand how Amharic is different from English and create something similar to describe the two Amharic sentences. Doable? Yeah, okay. The second example is openness and creativity. So here is a simple fragment of English. I've given you several sentences of English. As you can see, they're very, very simple sentences of English. And following this, I've given you a grammar uh, for these eight sentences. So I've given you a lexicon. I've given you a partial list of rules for phonology and spelling, morphology, and syntax. And what I want you to do is I want you to look at it. So this is an example on openness and creativity, right? What I want you to do is I want you to read through all that. So that the question itself is quite long, as you can see, right? And I want you to answer these two questions. How does the grammar of the language have to be changed if we add in a new noun, tab? We add in a new verb to the lexicon, fan. We add a new noun, jan, etc. So from a very small fragment of English with a very simple lexicon and simple morphology, phonology, and syntactic rules, how does the openness and creativity of the system change when we add in more complexity to the system? Right? So that, that, that's the question that you need to add. And then, so tell me how does a grammar change and then list 10 additional sentences, which the grammar can now generate and describe using these new words. And as you can see, these are not proper words of English, right? Well, some of them are like spam, right? And gab, uh, but some of them may not be um, real words of English as well. Okay, is that clear? The second question, yeah, okay. The third one is about um, arbitrariness. So I've given you a sign um, and this, all of you know that this means no smoking. The sign has two components. Uh, there's a line that goes across a cigarette meaning no and a picture of the cigarette meaning cigarette or smoking. Uh, I want you to tell me, does each of the components have an arbitrary or an iconic relation with its meaning? Um, and you know, discuss the two elements separately and give me a reason as to why you think one could be arbitrary or one could be iconic or both are arbitrary, etc. 
So that's about arbitrariness. And then the second last question, so this is about symbolism, right? So this is uh, sound symbolism. So we kind of um, talked about mimetic or onomatopoeic words like bao bao and meow meow, et cetera. So this relates to that. So this is about sound symbolism. And what I want you to do is I want you to pronounce the words below according to regular English spelling. And for each pair of words, decide which member of the pair could refer to something heavy and which of these could mean something light. Okay, so I want you to kind of see whether there are certain vowels and certain consonants that you feel are more heavy than light um, in these words. And so I want you to do this individually and then discuss within your group to see if you are all consistent or if different people have different responses uh, to this. And the last example is uh, an example from Mandarin Chinese. Uh, so these are expressions of moving from one city to another, right? Uh, but of the form from X pass through Y to Z, right? And so remember that when you see the star symbol, it means unacceptable or ungrammatical in that particular language. So I've given you, he went from San Francisco through Chicago to New York as a grammatical sentence in Chinese and as an ungrammatical sentence in Chinese. Okay, so now you know which one is grammatical. This one is grammatical, A is grammatical, Phi B is ungrammatical. How would you characterize the form and the meaning relationship exhibited by these Chinese expressions? Okay, and I've given you a hint. Look at the ordering of places in the sentences and compare that to the journey being described. Okay, again, this might seem really, really complicated, but trust me, it's not. I want you to have fun with languages. Linguistics is all about having fun with languages other than English. So um, if, if you want to access this from your Blackboard really quickly, feel free to do that. It's already up on handout. So feel free to download it um, onto your system so that you each have an individual copy of it. And I will be now breaking you up into breakout rooms. I have a quick question. So you wanted us to answer all those questions separately and then just compare? No, uh, only the just, uh, just the fourth okay. question. Fourth yeah. one. Okay. Fourth question, each of you do it individually and then compare with your classmates, but everything else you, I want you to do it as a group. Okay, awesome. Okay, I will create breakout rooms right now. So I'm sorry, I missed what you said. The first the first thing I noticed was that the pronoun is like suffix to the end of the verb. Yeah. Right. The pronoun they or she suffix to the end of a verb. Okay, so for A. I wanted to say that if you want, one of you want to share the handout, you can probably do that. Um, I, I think anybody, you know, I have the setting as anybody can share it. So Landon or Erin or Kelly or any of you want to share the handout so that it might be easier for the group. Um, okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Do you want us to write these down or just talk about them? I mean, you, you know, since Landon is sharing it, Landon could write it down and then share it when we are discussing it within, with the, uh, the other group. So, you know, okay. that's easier. Yeah. Because there's a lot of questions, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank While I'm here, any questions? I'm going to be muted, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Um, I don't think I have any right now. Do you guys have any? No. I'm here on mute if you if you want me, and I will be going in between the breakout rooms. So, all right. Okay. Okay. 
This is followed by the present tense verb. So this is actually preceded by the present tense verb, right? Yeah, the, the present tense verb is precedes. at the is at the end of the sentence. And it precedes the pronoun, right? Yeah. Well, pronouns attach the verb. The objects, the objects before the verb. I, I guess it's that it's the objects before the verb. Right. In English, the object is after the verb. After the verb, yeah. Look good to everyone. Yeah. Okay, moving yep. on. Here's a grammar of a fragment of English. Consider these eight. So yes, if I could just jot in and say, so the way that uh, the other breakout room is doing, just like you guys, you're sharing it and then they're just typing in the answers. Mm -hmm. So that when we discuss it, you can just share your screen and show what your group discussed, so. Cool, yeah. okay. Okay, so the grammar of the eight sentences. All right, so there's the lexicon, there's the phonology, morphology, and syntax. Every sentence begins with a noun, every subject is followed by a verb, and some sentences have a second noun. <clears throat> so we're basically supposed to like re inventory all of that with adding in the new. Um, words yeah so if we add a new noun tad we'll go down here Actually, you know what i'll probably just i'm gonna go back up here real quick and bold our answers so that i can easily find them there we go and then back down here in bold okay okay so if we add a new uh noun tad to i'm guessing this list so pat taps pat you can add it to like pat taps grammar doesn't the grammar doesn't care about the, the things that we can create with it. The grammar is just like the rules and the structure. Correct. So if we add tad, that's adding, that's just adding a new noun. It's, it's adding, adding a new lexicon. So it'll just update our lexicon to be, and it says it's a noun. In the, in the lexicon, nouns are just marked as noun. So we're just like. Okay. I think someone was trying to say something. Was anyone trying to say something? Oh, it sounded like it. If we add a new verb fan, a verb with an object. Okay. Well, let's see what happens to verbs. Verbs. Object means followed by a noun. So it'd be like tap. We add the noun Jan. That yeah. would be just the same as adding a noun to the lexicon. Yeah. 
the verb gab, the verb has no object. With the verb not followed by an action. Yeah. Okay, would be the same. Same for A, yeah. Okay, now we make 10 additional sentences using these additions. Okay. So we could, and do we need to include all of the other or just? Um, I think as long as we got new ones. As long ones, as we're following the rules, then, okay. Yeah. So. so and basically, so we, we noun, noun, verb, optional noun. Let's see. Okay. Um, that would just be like um like a descriptor of like what Pat is doing. I don't know exactly what that would be called. It'd be um wouldn't be a state of being, it'd be a uh... oh my goodness. It's been too long since I've taken English grammar. Um <laughs> Pat who gabbed. It's a uh, description of what the or what the direct object is doing. I'll just write that for now. Or was doing because I guess it's past tense. And then if there's the new verb pay. Um, be like an implied direct object maybe because it's like they gapped with each other and it's not stated but it might be implied but with each other would be how you would make it a full sentence no that's literally wrong. A sentence is a subject and a verb. Oops, that's another one. Um, so like Sam paid Pat. Um, in the interest of time, because we have only two more minutes, I would suggest leaving this uh, because you have a couple of sentences and then just going into four and five. Uh, okay. The rest of it. Dr. Menon, yes. I, had a, I had a question because I wasn't, I guess I wasn't understanding, but does a sentence always need a subject, verb, and an object? Well, it depends on the grammar, right? So if you scroll up, um, Olivia, is that you who's sharing? No, it's me. It's me sharing. Trinity, okay, yeah, so look at the grammar, um, go up, go up, yeah, so here you have the rules, which, you know, of, of, of this particular oh, grammar that I've given you, right, so every word begins with a consonant, every word has A after the initial consonant, etc., right, mm -hmm. and then in the syntax, you have every sentence begins with a noun, the subject, so this is the grammar that you are following for the purpose of this assignment. Of, of this activity, yeah. Okay, so not just normal English grammar. It was just right. this one. Okay, uh, but in normal English grammar it has to have an object. Uh, are you or, asking me in, in English if every sentence always begins with a subject? Is that what you asked? Or like, do they have to have objects to be all a the time? Or are they... uh, so uh, it depends on what verb you're talking about, right? So in English, you do have intransitive verbs that cannot mm -hmm. be an object. So if you say John slept, you cannot say John slept Mary, right? To say that there's a subject and an object. The, so when you say John slept, there's a subject of sleeping, but there's no object because an intransitive word cannot take an object. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so to, to in short, no. 
Um, in English, you don't need to have objects after words because there are some words that cannot take an object. Okay, well, I'm gonna go and close the breakout room. So if you really quickly wanna, you know, uh, talk about the others. Okay. Hi, I guess, can you explain what a transitive verb is more to me? Cause like, I understood that um, we were having a disagreement on one cause I thought that like. Yeah, so um, English has three different kinds of verbs. Um, they are intransitive verbs, transitive verbs and ditransitive verbs. Uh, to everybody who just joined, I'm answering a question that Nayel asked me. Um, about the different kinds of verbs in English. And I think it's, it's useful information for everybody. So let me let me walk you through each of this. So if you see my whiteboard, let me open up a whiteboard. Okay. Um, there are intransitive verbs in English. Can you tell me an example of an intransitive verb in English? Anybody? Go. Go is a good example, eat, sleep, right? Intransitive verbs can only take subjects, no objects. It's ungrammatical eat. for- Eat what? is not. Eat, uh, well, eat is an intransitive verb. You can actually take an object, but it's supposed to be an intransitive, maybe not. Maybe now I am self-guessing myself. Yeah, let's for the, ex yeah, let's just not, Take eat as an example. Let's take yeah, it's, it's kind of it's kind of ambitransitive. It is. It is. Well, because it is. It is. if you have is a go intransitive, or is that just like the command form of go? Um, like, would you say with the subject, like I go? Yeah. So I go, okay. but you know, I went. But when you say I went to um, Mexico, that to Mexico is actually not the object, it's a prepositional form. So it's an adjunct and not an object of the sentence. So, um, so go is an intransitive verb, you can only take a subject. Um, sleep is an intransitive verb, again, you can only take a um, subject. Uh, there's no object of sleeping, there's no object of going. Um, any additional thing that you add to that verb is going to be a prepositional form and an adjunct. Uh, form, right? Now, the other uh, kind of verb in English is the transitive verbs that take both a subject and an object. So a classic example is um, love, um, uh, hit, not, not a great verb, I know, but it, you know, it is a transitive verb. So um, these take both a subject and an object. And then you have the ditransitive verbs uh, in English that take one subject and two objects. A classic example of a ditransitive verb is put and give. So um, I put the book on the table. I gave the book to Nayel, right? So there are three different kinds of verbs, intransitive, transitive, and ditransitive. And depending on, we often call this as argument structure. Depending on the argument structure of the verb, you actually get to see whether the subject, the, the verb takes a subject or an object. Is that clear, Nayel? Nayel, can yes. you? Yeah? Yes, I think I have like maybe a few more questions on it. Okay. Yeah, I can ask you them later. 
Yeah, we yeah. can discuss that later in the interest of time. All right. So how was your group activity? I mean, I joined in the breakout room. So, you know, <laughs> okay, let's start with uh, Kelly's uh, team. If you want to go ahead and tell me the answer to the first question. I'll let um, Landon do that because he has the notes. Okay. Okay. okay, first question. Took us a while, but we got there in the end. Um, so we basically like used like the same, tried to base it on the statements that you provided. So um, the first one said a pronoun they or she is first in the sentence. So we put the pronoun acho or at is suffix to the verb. Okay. Um, uh, Landon, are you sharing? Because we cannot see your screen. Oh, you want me to share? Sure. No, I, I, I was asking. You don't need to, but. Sure, I can share. Okay. All right. Instead of um, instead of that followed by the verb, the verb is after the possessing noun. Um, the possessing noun has the prefix ya instead of the apostrophe s the English has. Um, but it is the same as English in this sense, it's followed by the possessed noun, which is singular if the subject is um, she and plural of today. And if the possessed noun is plural, it has och. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that, uh, what about the other uh, team? Is this what you had as well? Or any additional um, grammatical rules or anything different? No, we had about the same. Okay. Well, let me. Um, I have a activity key, which is also up on Blackboard. I haven't opened it up because obviously um, I was waiting till the end of class. But um, so this is what I had. Uh, very similar to um, I think what Landon uh, Landon's team came up with. Uh, but this activity key will be up on Blackboard. Uh, so you can compare your answers with, um, you, you know, the answer key just to make sure that everything is there. But I think, you know, pretty much you covered all the, uh, the points that you had in this one. So good. Um, okay, um, Olivia's team, do you want to give the answer to the second question? And then Trinity has those notes. Yeah, so. I have those notes, so I'll share my screen. Uh, da, 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 group activity share. All right, so scroll down. Ours is in bold. So this is we didn't necessarily understand exactly what uh, the, they were asking, but like if we added a new noun tad to Pat taps Pat, mm -hmm. then we would have to add a conjunction. So uh, if we wanted to add Tad as another direct object, so it'd be Pat taps Pat and Tad. Yeah, but so uh, so I think you did not understand what the question was asking um, you to do. So this is way too complicated than what the question is asking. The question literally says, if there is a new noun Tad that you add, go back, scroll back up Trinity, what do you yeah. do with this lexicon and the rules and morphology and syntax, right? So it is as simple if you can stop sharing, uh, Trinity. Okay, one second, stop share. So literally all that I wanted you to do was <laughs> that, right? How does the grammar change? The lexicon, in addition to what you have in ANF, also contains tad, comma, a noun, fan, a verb followed by a noun, jan. So much more simpler. I think you guys maybe thought about it a little bit more complicated um, and added a lot more creativity to the lexicon, which is completely okay, but not what the question asked you for. Uh, this was literally what the answer would have looked like. And I know that Landon's team got that right because I was there during the breakout yeah. session for that. Um, so this is what that would look like. And then you would also have to change the rules for the phonology because you know you would have to add in a couple more sound systems, a couple more phones because of the, you know, uh, the f and the t and the j, um, g, et cetera, um, as well as a couple of the nouns 
um, every word begins with a consonant and every word has a after the initial consonant and every word ends with a consonant or a diphthong. So just a couple of minor changes to the phonology and spelling, no additions needed to morphology or syntax. And then your generation of the 10 additional sentences would look as simple as this, Sam, Pat's Tad, Pat, Pan's Jan, et cetera. Very similar to what we had in the, uh, you know, the, the sentences um, that I gave you as examples. So nothing too complicated. I think you guys maybe overthought this a little bit. I could see that when I was in the breakout room. Um, so my, my, you know, number one uh, advice to all of you is just follow the prompt as closely as you can when I give you a question like this. Do not overthink it. Just, you know, to the point, right? Um, absolutely to the point. And obviously, you, you can always ask me if you have any clarification questions on that. Did anybody try to do the third question? Because I know that you might not have had time to do it. Any any group? Um, I know Trinity, you are did in London. Yeah, okay. I will let you take that one then. Yep, that's right. So the line itself is arbitrary and the cigarette um, is, is iconic. Yep. Yep. Makes and, sense. <laughs> and did you do the fourth or the fifth one or no? Yeah, we got them all. Okay. Okay. <laughs> kind of rushed. Um, number four. Uh, okay. We generally agreed on on everything, okay. Um, okay. but it got harder as we went. Okay. Like the it, the one the ones where like they had an O or O, mm -hmm. those are very obviously heavier, hundred percent obviously. Um, I'm being a little facetious, but I mean they seem heavier. I don't know why, but they seem heavier. Um, and then the ones where the only difference was an L inserted, mm -hmm. the, the, the complex cluster seemed to be heavier than the simple like beginnings. And then the ones where the difference was a su, ta, su, da, mm -hmm. those stop consonants seem to be heavier. Yeah, well. and we will talk, you know, I know we're out of time. So we will talk about this at the beginning of uh, Tuesday's class. Uh, but if you have in the other, group, if you haven't done four and five, I, um, you know, highly recommend that you do it at home and then compare that with the answer key that I will make available. And then we will come back on Tuesday and discuss it. Sounds good. All right. Thank you all so much. Have a good weekend. I will see you next Tuesday. Bye. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you.